Hello and welcome everyone to today's uh, live webcast Q&A series. This is, uh, my name is Warren Coos and I am the High Browns Product Specialist for Buffet Crampon USA. Uh, we are going to be talking today um, as part of the Rhapsody Live webcast. This is going to be a strictly Hans Hoyer talk and we're going to be talking with our special guests, our very special guests, uh, from the Virginia Commonwealth University, Patrick Smith. Um, so, well, uh, here he is. So uh, go ahead and say hello. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Patrick. Oh, thanks, Warren. It's great to be here. And a special thank you to Hans Hoyer and, and Buffet Crampon for this opportunity to uh, just have a, a little chat, just to you know, be able to, to, to talk horn, to talk brass, to talk uh, about music in these really extraordinary times that we're in right now. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm really, really thrilled to be here. Uh, as Warren mentioned, uh, my name is Patrick Smith. I'm teaching uh, horn and music history at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I just finished my 16th year at VCU, and I finished my 11th year as a uh, Hans Hoyer uh, performing artist. Um, Growing up, I, I, I'm not originally from Virginia, I'm originally from Florida, uh, and um, my path is sort of um, unique uh, in that I, I really didn't get serious about the horn until my senior year of high school, and even then it wasn't uh, super serious, it was just more because uh, my eyesight was sort of going and I wasn't going to be able to fly airplanes, so I needed to find something else to do. Um, so, and I, I didn't know anything about horns. I, I didn't know anything about bore size. I didn't know anything about free blowing. I didn't know anything about mouthpieces. I didn't, I was, I knew nothing. Um, so, uh, you know, in my, in my first few years of college, I played on some of the, the, the more common uh, named instruments that, you know, my teachers had played. Uh, my first teacher, Bruce Atwell, uh, played a Con 8D. Uh, that was back at the time when the Philharmonic, New York Philharmonic, was a, was an all 8D section, um, and that's what was that, that's what was taught. Um, so I played 8D for a number of years, uh, and then when I moved to Connecticut uh, for my masters, um, I, I switched to another big bore sized horn, and I simply had not come across the name Hans Hoyer at that time. This was 19. 96, uh, 1995, 96. And um, I, I was doing a lot of orchestral playing, uh, you know, being in Hartford, I was, it was two hours from Boston, two hours from New York City. So I heard a lot of those big orchestral sounds and uh, still kind of figuring out who I was as a musician. And it really wasn't until I went back to uh, Florida to pursue my doctoral studies with Paul Basler at the University of Florida at Gainesville, when I started becoming more familiar with with bore size, with uh, diameter size, with uh, horn construction, the big differences between a Geyer model and, and a Crespi model, um, I really was very green behind the ears uh, early on, and I just simply didn't know. I, I played what I felt was, uh, you know, what sounded good. I wasn't really thinking about what felt good, and. Uh, after I came to Virginia in 2005, uh, it was about 2009, 2010, when I felt like the horn that I had, um, that, that big bore-sized uh, instrument, that big orchestral horn, was, was really kind of holding me back. I was doing a lot of woodwind quintet playing, a lot of brass quintet playing, a good bit of orchestral playing as well. And uh, what I kept hearing from people over and over, and, and solo recitals too, what I kept hearing from people over and over was, you know, can you, can you not play so big? Can you, can you not play so loud? Uh, and I was like, you know, I didn't think I, I was. I just felt like I was playing. And um, so I, you know, I talked to some people, some very reputable, reputable people that I knew. And I said, you know, what, what, what do you recommend? And they said, well, you might want to consider switching, switching gears here. And uh, I said, you know, what do you mean? They said, well, you know, maybe switching to a Geyer style horn with, a, with the right mouthpiece combination can make you a very versatile player in a lot of different settings. And uh, it was right about that same time that Hoyer had come out with the G10 uh, model horn. I think it may have been a year before, a year and a half before. It was right around that time. And uh, I was very interested in it. 
and I, I remember getting in the car and driving to Boston uh, to see Bob Osman because they had some of these in stock. And of course, things have obviously changed since 2009, 2010, where we just you know go on our smartphones and order a new horn. Uh, but I remember going up there and I remember trying the horn out and, and I was just like, holy cow, this is just, okay, it feels so good. I wasn't used to, to that being a reaction. I was so focused on, on how it sounded, right? And I love the sound of the horn, but it was it, the, the freedom that I had on the instrument was really uh, quite amazing. And so, uh, so I got the horn and I came back and went, didn't say anything and went into a woodwind quintet rehearsal and the comments were like, what did you do? <laughs> you sound different. And I was like, yeah, you know, equipment uh, matters. So, um, you know, I, I'm really, really grateful that that, that happened. Um, I, I don't want to say playing on the Hoyer G10 is, is easier. Um, for me, it just was the right fit for where I was at that point in my career and in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I like I said, I've been playing on this instrument now for 10 or 11 years, and I really feel like I, I know where every pitch is. I know what every nuance is. I know where every every interval is. Um, I just I, I feel like I, I just I know it that well, and I wasn't used to it, having that experience with our other horns that I played. So, um, I, you know, I, th this horn has has uh, continued to to support my versatility in orchestral playing with the Richmond Symphony and other orchestras in Virginia. Uh, it's helped me to uh, be very versatile in the different chamber ensembles, different chamber settings uh, that I, I play in, and not just brass and woodwind quintet, but also things like, uh, you know, a horn and percussion ensemble, uh, horn and voice, horn and vocal ensembles. Obviously, with COVID, we've had to be very creative, in, and we'll get to that maybe a little bit here pretty soon, but finding ways to really be innovative in our musical uh, productions and performances. And I'm just really, really grateful that I have this this piece of, of, of equipment uh, to play on because I, I don't have to worry about what am I going to have to do differently in this kind of setting. I can just pick up the horn and play, and, uh, and I'm really, really grateful for it. So a, a great product, and I, I, I'm really happy about the, the partnership with uh, Buffet Crampon and Hans Hoyer USA and, and the opportunity to be here to talk Hoyer and horns with all of you today. Um, Absolutely. Wow. Uh, well, speaking of being grateful, that is a uh, singing review, and I'm not sure I knew all of the nuances of that story. So that's uh, fantastic for myself, along with our, our viewers, to know um, some of those things. I'm curious uh, about a few things, but um, how did you feel um, some some of the changes? I know you were going from, from an AC to the, uh, to the G10, which is not only a brand change, but also a uh, completely different rap, a completely different feel, everything is different. Um, did you have any uh, anything with the sound that was that was uh, that was different as well that maybe you felt that was um, but even today, I mean you've been at shows over the last uh, decade uh, with being a Hoyer artist um, and, and playing on your G10. Um, and playing other uh, other brands, to, is there a, a specific sound difference that you have with um, with Hoyer that you relate to? Yeah, you know, uh, Paul Basler, um, who is just one of my favorite people in the world, uh, used to say when I was a student with him, he'd say, you know, we have to be able to sing what we have in here, right? We have to we have to we have to feel emotion first. And then we have to be able to convey that emotion. And it's the instrument that we play is simply the vessel through which we communicate those emotions of our soul. And I know that's all, you know, kumbaya, deep, philosophical, but it's true. It's very, very true. And, um, you know, for me, up until 2010, 2011, um, I, I was really struggling to, to find that vessel through which I could accurately communicate those emotions. If that makes sense, um, you know, I felt like I had, you know, the, the the gear that I had was okay, but you know, maybe the microphone was a little too strong, or the amp was a little too weak. You know, I'm, I'm referring for for horn, obviously, with you know, mouthpiece size or wrap or bell size or what have you. And um, yeah, you know, when when I when I switched to the G10, 
uh, the first thing I noticed, having been a, a, a big bore, uh, crusty rat player for uh, well, 20 years, 25 years by that point, uh, was I was overpowering the G10. I was blowing too hard. I was pushing too hard. I was working too hard. Um, and and that was really one of the things that surprised me was was how and I know this sounds bad and those those younger students who are, are watching uh, take this with a grain of salt how little effort I had to put into making a good sound okay I didn't have to work real hard I didn't have to get up and uh, uh, push uh, you know it was just you know it was that simple. And uh, it took me a while to really figure that out. And um, but by a while, I mean, you know, uh, uh, probably 18 months or so, 18, 24 months to really figure that out. And, um, you know, to, to, to learn those new tendencies, to learn those new ways of playing. Um, but the end result that I found is, is a, a combination of mouthpiece and, and horn that, you know, what... I really like the way I sound, <laughs> and I, I don't mean that egotistically at all. I am not that kind of person. What I what I mean is when I listen to recordings of myself, when I listen to myself with orchestra, I listen to myself in a solo, listen to myself in quintet. I love the timbre that I'm able to get. I love the color I'm able to get. I love the sonorities I'm able to get. That um, that really, I feel, allow me to match musically the mood and the emotion that I'm feeling here, and to be able to convey that. And as an artist, I think it's a really important thing that we 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 are able to do. You know, whether we're a, a musician or a visual artist or a dancer or a sculptor, you know, everything that we create is is ours. But it's a thing that we communicate with others. And you know, anybody can sit at a potter's wheel and make a make a vase, right? I mean, I guess anybody could do that. You don't want to see mine. I stunk at it. That's why I went to music. Um, but you know, if there's no love in what we do, if there's no emotion in what we do, it's just sound. It's just a vase. It's just whatever. And I'm really, really grateful that, you know, along my journey, you know, our our paths met and crossed, and uh, and I'm really, really grateful for the, for this instrument. Yeah, we're we're equally, if not more, grateful uh, for for you having your journey, obviously, and sharing it with us today is a real treat. Um, uh, a few things to, to really kind of unpack there um, as well, and uh, maybe a good segue actually from from what you were talking about, going from from a crispy style instrument to a Geyer style instrument is going to have a lot of those nuanced you know changes that you need to get used to, um, and you obviously went through that period. Uh, a lot of people um, do that as well yeah, uh, when they make that change, um, and there's also uh, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that it's not a, you know, pick it up and, you know, have that realization of, it. you know, this is just a different instrument and a different way to approach it um, mm -hmm. to get that same sound. Like like you said, it being easier to, to create a, a full fullness of sound with the G10 or the, or a Geyer's time horn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but that might be a good segue because you mentioned um, you're performing and being happy with your your sound with uh, and also with uh, your mentor and, and teacher Paul Basler. Um, I didn't you do a, a project uh, recently with him and his music being part of? We did, yeah. Uh, it was uh, about four years ago um, where uh, Tomoko Kanamaru, uh, a very very dear, dear friend of mine, pianist uh, up in New Jersey. Uh, and I, along with uh, my other dear friend, James Nagus, who teaches now at the University of Georgia, uh, uh, again, two of my favorite people in the world, uh, we did a recording of uh, music by Paul Basler. And it was something that I really, really wanted to do for, and I'd wanted to do for quite a while, um, having had the opportunity to study with Paul and to really not just play his music and, and to get to know him personally, but to be able to go into to his studio on a weekly basis and every single week practically it was oh here's this new piece i just wrote let's play it um and you know he'd sit at the piano and he'd bang these things out and, and i'd sit in the chair and i'd sit there stand or whatever and we're sitting there playing these pieces and we played 
you know, golly, so many of his pieces over the years, you know, it, you know, first drafts, second drafts of what have become very, very popular works for horn players. And, and uh, so I, it was very important to me to, to, to record a number of those pieces. And that was uh, the Reflections CD that uh, came out a few years ago. Um, and I'm very, very pleased with that CD. I was so happy to, uh, you know, to, again, to have, to have had, to, to have found the vessel through which to communicate, uh, those emotions. I, I really, you know, I, I, I listened to that, that CD and I, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's how I wanted to play that piece. That's how I wanted to do that. That's how, you know, Paul would want it done. Um, and on the flip side of that, I also would say that, you know, it, it isn't to say that's how the piece should always be played. I don't think music lives in a, in a vacuum. You know, I think we should all be, you know, creating uh, our own interpretations, but it was important for me to at least present a, a CD or an album with, with what I consider to be a, a modeling tool for, for others to, to, to use as they form their uh, interpretations and style. So yeah, you know, we, we did that album. Uh, and then two years ago, two years ago, I think this week, uh, James and Tomoko and Anamia Larson uh, from Stockholm uh, recorded an album of James Nagus's music, uh, and certainly not all of his music, but a, a good chunk of, of his stuff. And of course, two years later, his compositional output has tripled, I think. Um, and I'm just I'm so proud of, of him uh, in everything that he's doing. He's just uh, such a, an incredible, incredible person, such a gifted musician. Um, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. But James is also, um, if it reminds me if I'm, I'm wrong or maybe uh, completely inaccurate information here, but uh, James is also a product of the University of Florida. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, he did his undergraduate at Michigan and did his master's at, at Florida with Paul Basler. Uh, we missed each other by about a year. Um, and, uh, and then he went on to, to Iowa for his uh, doctorate with Jeff Agrell. So uh, another Florida product there as well. Yep. Yep. We're on the Basler tree together. Um, so yeah, you know, both those albums, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy with, with the final product, but you know, I, I think as musicians, we all have different strengths, right? We all have a different thing that makes us who we are. You know, for some people it's, it's articulation for some people, it's philosophical concepts of how to produce sound for other people. It's uh, technique, other people, it's high range, it's low range, you know, for me, it's sound. You know, it, it, the, the, the one thing that I, I, I really try to instill in my students, uh, yes, you know, technique, yes, repertoire, yes, 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 all those things. But I stress tone with my students that, that you know, to be able to pick up your horn and sound like a beautiful horn player with a beautiful horn sound. You know, I was joking, like, if you pick up your trombone and you, you know, start playing, you sound like a chainsaw. Uh, I won't insert a musical chainsaw joke here. Um, you know, that's not a good thing. You know, you want to sound like a, a, a characteristic uh, instrument and or a characteristic sound on that instrument. And, uh, you know, for me, it's tone. And I, I've spent a lot of time in my life working on tone production and, you know, mouth shape and vowel shape and air compression and, you know, mouthpiece size and bore size and all these things, right? Um, but, you know, for me... It, it's about sounding uh, what I consider to be beautiful, right? Having a beautiful, rich, resonant sound, and that's what I, I, I still keep working towards. I don't think we ever ultimately get there to where we don't have to work anymore. But, but yes, and get back to that question. Yes, the, the Paul Basler Reflections album and then uh, the, the James Nagus um, album that came out just a couple years ago. Very, very happy with both of those. They're available on Spotify. You can find them in all those places you download music. Uh, and um, if all else fails, you can email me and then I can I can get you set up with a copy. You can just email me at psmith7, letter P as in Patrick, S-M-I-T-H, the number seven, at vcu.edu. That's great. Uh, if you weren't going to do it, I was going to uh, make sure <laughs> they were available um, at those means. And that is, these are some great uh, albums. And I don't mean it just because Patrick is here sitting with us in the room, but um, <laughs> Patrick has some, some great 
uh, decisions on there from Paul Basler and from uh, James uh, Nagus. And uh, those two uh, titles are actually called Reflections and Solstice. Uh, okay. That's correct. Those are, yep. those are really great albums to pick up. And uh, the emphasis on your sound is is very apparent. It's something that I, I would listen to every day. Yeah. So um, there, I, I don't think you're being, um, as you put it, uh, you get to school and saying that that's something that you're <laughs> really great stuff. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit to talk about great. Um, some uh, current events, and current uh, current things, and maybe some struggles that we've been talking about. But um, it, you're being the associate professor of um, French horn and uh, music history. If I'm not getting that right, please correct me. <laughs> but um, at the BCU, uh, your entire last year has been virtual, uh, as, mm -hmm. as I understand. It. Yeah. So. Um, I guess for our listeners who are kind of struggling with a more virtual or uh, isolated world uh, in, in the music world, the music industry in general, uh, practicing at home, developing sound and, and all of this stuff, how have you been able to overcome some of the challenges with teaching uh, over the past year? And uh, just tell me about um, maybe some, some things you've been over overcome. Sure. Yeah, uh, for us at VCU, we've been uh, completely virtual since March 11th of 2020. Um, and uh, just like many other schools around around the, world, uh, the country and around the world. And, uh, you know, let's face it, it's, it's really hard to get motivated to, to do something when the thing that you are training or being trained to do isn't doing anything, right? You know, so, you know, what are we trying to do? We're learning how to play the horn. What do you want to be? Well, I want to play in a military band. I want to be a soloist. I want to play in the symphony. Symphonies are out of work. Military bands are still doing some things, uh, but on a limited basis. Uh, solo opportunities. Well, if you have the recordings of the accompaniment, great, because nobody's going to want to stand right behind a horn bell and play piano, right? I mean, so there's all these things that are, that are going on, and um, it can be very demoralizing. Uh, you know, for it's been it's been a really rough thing for for the students at VCU, not just in Horn, but in all of our areas, as it is for for many students. I think uh, everywhere that's been affected by this. Um, so my my what I've what I've focused on um, after the you know the oh my god moment of last spring, you know, oh well, how long is this going to last? Well, all right. um, this is temporary, okay, and yeah. It, it's it's hard to see beyond tomorrow. It's hard to see beyond today. Uh, in, in today's world, we're, we're we're such a microwave society where you know we want something, we want it right now. We pop it in, hit it, hit the microwave for thirty seconds, ding, done, there it is, right? Um, that it, it's hard to process what temporary means with something like this. Um, you know, VCU right now is talking very sincerely about returning to an in-person environment this fall. And it looks like it's probably going to happen. Um, so it is temporary. We're going to get through this. But I think that the more exciting thing that I've been trying to pitch to students and trying to embrace myself as an artist is what's the opportunity here? Right. You know, classical music, music, it just it, music, period, has never been the same old thing. It's always evolved. It's come from something. It's developed into something else that did not exist before. And I think really, you know, what we're going to see is, you know, yeah, we're going to see symphony orchestras coming back and we're going to hear the Masterworks concerts again. But we're also going to see, I think, the sort of renaissance from artists who, you know, have kind of went, you know, wow, I, I, I didn't know this was possible. You know, I didn't know anything about uh, multi-track editing. And now, you know, here is the uh, the Warren Coos trumpet ensemble with Warren Coos playing all 12 parts, right? And, uh, you know, we're seeing more and more of that. You know, having, I, I've encouraged my students to, you know, to, to work on duets, trios, quartets, quintets uh, on their own. You know, that way practicing, uh, you know, throughout the range, practicing individual technical things, but then also practicing horn ensemble on their own, 
And then also becoming familiar with the technology, which you don't really have to spend any money on today. You can download a lot of these things for free and edit your own stuff in the comfort of your own home. Um, and I mean, if I can do it, anybody can do it. It's, it's very easy uh, to do. Um, but to find the opportunities, what's possible, what isn't being done, and what could be done. And what could I do to contribute to that? That's the challenge for every single one of us as musicians, because obviously we have to put food on the table, right? We have to survive. We have to pay rent. We have to buy gas for our cars. Uh, we have to get a new bicycle, you know, whatever it is that we need. We have to have money to do it. How are we going to earn a living? And, you know, I think it's a great opportunity to try new things and maybe maybe COVID has sort of forced that forced our hands a little bit before we were really ready to as a musical culture and society. Then again, maybe it's the perfect time, but you know, you know, to really think outside the box and to embrace the opportunity to, to live in the now. And I mean, try something wild and radical, you know, if, if you're sitting there going, you know, I really, I really don't know anything about horn sequencing and, and looping and uh, you know, now's the time go listen to some Arcadi show clopper. Download some apps. You can be the next one, right? And then what else is possible? You know, um, is it, it, it's finding the opportunity because the because this temporary thing will be over soon, and you know it's going to be kind of important to have some new skills in, in whatever comes next. Yes, that's absolutely true, and I I think you touched on a few things that I I didn't know if I really realized that the, the prime word is opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity happening and has been happening for, for over this past year. Um, probably something that I didn't realize was uh, something you said that you had your, your students play with themselves for mm -hmm. over a quartet and I have, have them learn each part of the quartet and, and record it. But if anything, I think, um, and maybe it's just from, from my background, but we didn't in my generation we record ourselves nearly enough mm -hmm. that. and um maybe that's something different in today's world but it's something that in the past year everyone's had oh yeah you know i remember an undergrad you know if, if we were going to record ourselves you know i had to take my dual cassette deck and a microphone and i literally had it in the small suitcase that i'd lug up three flights of stairs with my horn and all right you know uphill both ways in the snow and then set it all up and then play and record and then tear it all down and go home and put in the cassette. I mean, it's just, it was such a pain in the rear end. And now, you know, you, we can get, uh, you know, a, a decent mic to clip onto our iPhone. Uh, is it ideal? No, but it's so easy now. The accessibility to hear ourselves and to record ourselves in, and listen in real time is is a great opportunity and uh yeah i totally know what you mean by that totally no warranted. reason not to validate yeah so nope yeah <laughs> the, um, the added value of playing with yourself even you know knowing yeah. where the tendencies are as a player playing against yourself i don't think we've ever really experienced that either like, right regularly or at least wide uh wide you know mass spread uh, across the industry so that's, that's right really yeah. Um, if anyone's uh, any, anyone who is watching has any any questions, um, should have, have uh, prompted you guys sooner. But um, if you have any questions for Patrick while we're here and while we're uh, kind of energized about any of the topics we've had or anything new, anything new that you want to ask Patrick or myself about Hans Hoyer, uh, his journey, um, or or his recordings or our uh, discussion on distant or virtual learning. Um, yeah, we can uh, we can answer them here live for you. Um, but yeah, this was this has been really, really great. And uh, I want to thank you, Patrick, for, for everything um, that you've uh, you've been doing over the past year and also uh, feel really grateful for 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 things as well. But uh, it I'm going to give, a, give a, a few a few opportunities for you to, to talk about um, as I'm talking. Uh, there is a question, actually. Uh, Great. When you initially, uh, this is from one of our uh, 
division managers at Buffet Bay Crampon USA. Um, you know Donnie Todd as well. Um, mm -hmm. he, he chimes in with a question. When you were initially talking about or, or transitioning over to the G10 mm -hmm. um, from your AD, why did you choose the G10? Why did you go towards something um, something else in the Hans Hoyer lineup, like the 6802, or uh, I know we talked a lot about you choosing it for the, for the feeling and the sound and stuff, but um, maybe a little bit more details on why specifically the G10 worked for you. Uh, great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, my answer may kind of surprise you a little bit, uh, but it is the truth. And that is um, a couple of my students came to lessons and we're talking about this new horn. And uh, I, one student in particular who uh, at the time had just invested um, almost five figures into a, a, a double horn. And, uh, and which, I mean, great horn, he, awesome, good, great. I, you know, it, it, yeah, I wanted it to work out for him. Uh, but for me, um, I'm a little more frugal. <laughs> and I heard a lot of great things about this instrument and, you know, and, and you know, I heard, you know, top level players saying, hey, you know, I, I tried out this horn. It was, it was this, that and the other. And, and I was like, I need I need something new. I need a change. And, um, you know, when I picked up the horn and started playing it, I was just like, yeah, this is it. This is the one. Um, I, I want to. Uh, well, I forget. Well, no, I remember who it was. It was Ethel Merker. Um, years and years ago at a workshop um, where I was trying out a different horn. I think it was 1997, 1996, somewhere in there. Um, but I kept going back to the showroom and I just kept trying this one particular horn. She's like, I don't think you can put that down. I was like, no, I can't. She says, you know, when you pick up a horn that you can't put down, that's the one for you. And that's how the G10 was. I mean, I, I sat in Bob's uh, second story of his his older shop there. Um, I must have been up there for an hour and a half, two hours, just playing, you know. And I, would, I just I didn't want to put it down because that means I would have to start driving back on I-95 back to Virginia, and I did not want to do that. Um, so that's the honest truth. It, it uh, I, I learned about the horn from some students, and then did a little more research on my own, and then uh, went and tried the horn and. The rest is history. You know, I'm not one of these people that's, you know, really into, um, you know, trying this and trying that. This and that. I, I'm not a I'm not a, a, a tech nerd, <laughs> a, a, an equipment nerd is what I call it. Uh, and and I know people who are very very knowledgeable with instruments and 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 dimensions of instruments. And I have great respect for them. I'm not one of those people. Uh, I'm a person who is is very much, you know, how does it feel? How does it sound? How's the result? Okay. You know, uh, and that that's me. Maybe it's naive. I don't know. But that's, that's just me. So yeah, it, it was uh, learning from some students doing some research, trying the horn out. And I just couldn't put it down. Yeah. And, and, and when I went and when I swapped back to my other horn, my 8D, uh, horn, it was like, yeah, I want to put that down now. <laughs> Seriously, I did. I was like, I don't want to play this anymore. I want to play this one. Um, nice. so. um, yeah, and then uh, I think what you, you mentioned earlier, but also having the confirmation after after the purchase or after you had tried it for mm -hmm. a while in your rehearsal and where more comments were like, yeah, this is whatever you're doing, keep, keep doing it or whatever. It is. Yep. Uh, I did a lot of blind testing uh, for, with people, you know, where, uh, you know, they sit behind a screen or turn their backs and I, you know, play the same thing on, on two different horns to get their opinion. And, um, you know, almost a hundred percent of the time it was, yeah, that one, um, you know, there are some old school folks who were like, no, oh, I like that big eight D sound. I'm like, well, okay. Stegosaurus. Uh, <laughs> but there, there is something to be said about about that sound. We have there is, there is, and and I don't. I take nothing away from them. I think I think you know, Con made uh, made and still makes a very good product. Um, uh, for, for me, uh, my needs uh, became more than what that horn could do for me. 
And and this instrument, the G10, really was you know the right match for me with with my strengths and my needs. Uh, it's it's a very it's a very good compliment for who I am. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that, uh, Patrick. That was amazing. Um, we have we have hit our uh, our thirty minute time. Okay. Slot, but um, before before we go, before we wrap up, and I tell everything about what's happening next week, um, is there anything? That, uh, that you wanted to tell everyone about what's coming up for you, or maybe um, places that, that people could reach out to you and, and where you hang out online or, or, or anything to ask any follow-up questions other than- Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, email is the best way to reach me, uh, psmith7 at vcu.edu. Um, that's a great way to reach me. I, I, you know, I'm a little bit old school. I, I Facebook a little bit. I don't Twitter tweet that thing and the Instagram I can't figure that out and don't even try to teach me what TikTok is I cannot wrap my head around that but I need to learn some of those things but email is the best way to reach me and um, yeah if, if you're interested in uh, just you know getting together and doing a chat we can uh, we can certainly set up a time to to do that and if you're even interested in, in a video lesson uh, I'd be happy to do that I've kind of figured out how to do uh, Zoom horn lessons in the last 14 months. <laughs> but no, I, I, I am here for you. And if there's anything I can do for anybody who's watching, um, just let me know. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, a few, My pleasure. Yeah, a few, um, a few last uh, announcements before we uh, we sign off. But um, today is, today's been great. And uh, next week is going to be um, some, some great stuff as well. Uh, we actually have our uh, Summer Clarinet Academy happening next week. Uh, it is completely virtual, uh, which is the first time we've ever done something like that. Or and, and it's it's going to be great. There's um, a lot of students involved and a lot of faculty, uh, artist faculty involved in that as well. Uh, so next week you'll actually get to have a little bit of a peek into the life of the student. So we'll have our Woodwind product specialist, Matthew Vance, uh, hosting a, a complete, uh, what I would say, a round table with all the students and uh, them sharing some of their experiences throughout the week with uh, our five, um, I believe there's five artists who are gonna be involved in the, the academy. Um, so that's gonna be really exciting. And that'll be right here on Buffet Crampon USA's uh, New York showroom Facebook page at 6 p.m. Eastern next Thursday. Um, so yeah, uh, tune in for that. Please don't miss it. That will be a lot of fun. Um, and until, until then, uh, we will check you all out. I want to give one more last thank you and, uh, and, and everything to, to Patrick, our guest. Um, it has been great. It's been a real treat talking to you this past half hour. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for everything you've done for me. And thanks for uh, all your contributions to the horn world. We are so grateful. Thank you for to you and all all folks on our on our as who decide to play our instruments um, alike. So thank you so much. And until next time, thank you so much. This will be it for all of us here at Buffet Campan USA. <laughs>